Welcome to the Financial Advisor Success Podcast, where you go behind the scenes with financial planner, speaker, and consultant Michael Kitsis to hear stories of how leading financial advisors navigated the inevitable challenges that arise on the path to success and get insight from leading industry consultants about how to break through to the next level in your advisory business. And now here's your host, Michael Kitsis. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to the 164th episode of the Financial Advisor Success Podcast. My guest on today's podcast is Julia Carlson. Julia is the founder and CEO of Financial Freedom Wealth Management Group, a hybrid RIA based in Newport, Oregon, that oversees nearly $300 million of assets under management for almost 1,000 client households. What's unique about Julia, though, is the way that an unfortunate car accident that her daughter was in led Julia to transition very quickly from being the lead advisor that ran her own firm to expanding her staff and becoming the business owner of the advisory firm instead, if only out of sheer necessity of finding the time she needed to support her daughter's recovery, but in a way that allowed the firm to more than quadruple in the eight years since. In this episode, we talk in depth about Julia's journey through her advisory career, from her challenges early on gaining professional credibility as a young female advisor, where a prospect once told her she was too pretty to be a financial advisor, the way she got her foot in the door talking to small local business owners about their retirement plans and building wealth outside of their businesses, how reading Dave Ramsey's Total Money Makeover launched Julia's path towards a more holistic planning-centric approach to clients, and the way that she built her client base in the early years with Ramsey's endorsed local provider referral program, now known as SmartVestor Pro. We also talk about the transformation that Julia's business had to go through almost literally overnight when she got the call from her own client appreciation event that her daughter had been struck by a drunk driver and was being airlifted to the hospital in critical condition. How the pain of being forced to try to run her business from the ICU while being with her daughter during recovery led Julia to hire a president to take over running the firm on a day-to-day basis. The way that shift ended up allowing Julia's firm to double in size from $60 million to $120 million just two years later as her time and focus were freed up for growth. And how the firm's adoption of Gino Wickman's entrepreneurial operating system has allowed the business to run even more efficiently as it more than doubled again over the past several years. And be certain to listen to the end, where Julia talks about the real-world challenges of trying to let go of having so much control in your business, or as Julia puts it, how to stay in charge even if you're not in control anymore, the way that she took a hard look at everything she does and doesn't energize her from week to week to figure out her own strengths and where she should be focusing her time, and how the hardest thing to do in the end was letting go of client relationships, but how once Julia acknowledged that was a crucial step, the firm quickly figured out how to create an internal training program to ensure that other advisors would serve as clients up to Julia's standards. And so with that introduction, I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Financial Advisor Success Podcast with Julia Carlson. Welcome, Julia Carlson, to the Financial Advisor Success Podcast. Thank you. It's good to be here. I'm, I'm really excited about this episode and and the the discussion that I think is a wall that a lot of advisors hit where you know you you go out you get started you get some clients going you build a client base maybe a hire a staff member or two to support you and th- and then eventually you like you kind of hit the limit of what you can do as like as I was framing like as a self-employed person a, a highly leveraged highly efficient self-employed person and then there's this leap, there's this transition that that you can make that not all advisors do make where, as I like to put it, you, you, you move from being an advisor to being an advisory firm business owner and, and what you do and where you focus and what your role is in the business begins to, to shift. And I, I know that is certainly a, that's a journey you have lived with. I know some interesting trials and tribulations along the way. And I think it's one of the things that for a lot of advisors have a lot of those kinds of challenges and trials and tribulations along the way. It's it's sort of the the quintessential example of the the famous e myth story that you know, we we start in these businesses because we're good at a thing, and if we're really good at the thing, we get a lot of clients and we do a lot of that. And then at some point, you try to figure out how to how to stop being the doer of the thing and start being a business owner of a business that does that. 
And it's a really hard transition that not everybody actually makes. Yes, very true. And I have to say that there's a valley, maybe even a crevice in there that you that you have to work through it and really decide to plant your flag and say, this is what I want to build. Which I find for a lot of people, like you don't even get there without a usually a pretty significant amount of pain a- along the way. Like I, I think we just, we have this tendency you know, you start like, yeah, I got a lot of hours, and not very many clients. And I start getting clients and I have a slightly fewer spare hours. And then eventually you get enough clients, it fills all your hours. So you hire some staff to help you free up a few more hours. And then you can squeeze a little more productivity out. But at best, like I find all, almost every advisor makes this transition. You, like, you have to hit this time wall. You have to bury yourself under this time and capacity wall for a period of time before eventually saying like, I just don't think I can do this another 10 or 20, 30 years. I got to do something different. And the, and the pain of, I feel like I'm kind of buried and drowning in my business. It's really successful and I've never been more miserable. Like seems to be the trigger to get someone like across the line to say, all right, it's going to be painful to change, but it's got to be better than how not good it is right now, even though outwardly it seems good because the numbers are good and I've got clients and the income is good. But I'm not happy. Yeah. And and there was there was a point when I look back now, there there was that that point of transformation. I may have not known known it in the time, but now looking back, there was there was that pivotal event that happened that I had to really decide, am I going to be a solopreneur or am I going to build something that's gonna outlast me? So share with us some of this journey. Like, wh- how did you get started in the business? What did it look like in the early years of, of I guess, creating the proverbial, like, I, I planted my flag as a financial advisor. I'm going to get me some clients. I'm going to be a successful financial advisor. Yeah. So I live in a very small town in Newport, Oregon. So it's a, as far west as you can go right on the ocean in the central Oregon coast. And I, I moved here when I was 18, met my now husband, and at that point decided, okay, at 18, you know, I had no idea what I wanted to do in life. I knew that I was, I was interested in personal finance. I remember sitting on my grandpa's lap, looking at the TV, watching the stock ticker symbols going across the screen. <laughs> thinking, what's that about? (laughs) Okay. Like this seem, this, this looks neat and interesting. Like, okay. Yeah. And I got my first job at McDonald's and my dad said, okay, Julia, we're going to open up a Roth IRA. And that was my introduction to mutual funds. And so thankfully I was raised in a, in a healthy money environment and my parents, you know, kind of steward me and helped me get that going. And so when I uh, came to the Oregon coast, I went to work for a local bank and they had an investment department within the bank. And I kind of raised my hand and said, I would like to work in this department. And and once I did that, I think I was 19. I got licensed by when I was 20. I was a registered assistant there until 23, wherein I realized I put my hand up again and I said, I am ready to be a financial advisor. And they said, great, as soon as the advisor retires, you can have that position. (laughs) So if I would have... Excellent. (laughs) That's that's a long-term... I'm I'm presuming this like wasn't an advisor who happened to be in their late 60s and retiring immediately. No. (laughs) No. So I decided at that point, you know, I'm going to take the jump. I'm going to there was a, I was recruited into a more of an um, insurance general agency model that also had a broker dealer. And so I was driving three hours to my branch office one day a week, but building really a true business on the coast and, you know, pounding the pavement and introducing myself and, you know, everything you had to do back in the day to build the business. Yeah. So, so what did that like share a little more of what that looked like. So you know, you are a twenty-three year old female hanging your hanging your shingle 
as a as a financial advisor with a with an insurance company. What did that look like? I mean, what were you what were you doing? What were you trying to take out to the the marketplace? Yeah, well, I had a I I was fiercely independent. So, I was out to prove that I could do it and a lot of people probably thought I was too young. I had people say I was too pretty. I had my own self-doubt and all of that going on that I had to work on my own personal development. Well, and there's some interesting pieces there of, you know, too young is one thing that that comes from, I mean, that 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 comes across the board. We, and we do have an industry with a very high attrition rate, particularly for young folks, because we tell them to go get their own clients. They don't, they don't know anyone. And so they've got to do that from cold and, and not a lot of people survive. Too pretty is a little bit of a different angle though. Well, that I, I vividly remember, I was trying to build these relationships with attorneys and one of the attorneys, I came in one day to get, give some, my latest newsletter and some business cards out there networking. And he looked at me and he said, wow, well, don't you look pretty? You look like a cheerleader. <laughs> and I was like, how do you, I like my jaw dropped. How do you even respond to that? So I, I was out to prove something for sure in those early days, which ultimately created more of a rugged individualist where when you start feeling like, or start building a business that we get to later in my story, you know, that was a big transition that I had to get over my, my own ego at that point. Cause I had done a pretty good job building it up because I needed that confidence to go make it happen. Right. I think we'll end up talking about that more later, but that, that weird challenge, like the, the, the self-confidence we have to have or get or build or find in ourselves and, and even kind of just the, the, in the positive sense, the, the ego that goes with kind of getting that positive self-confidence in yourself to build through those challenging early years for a lot of people then becomes the, the blocking point later. Cause there's a, there's a period where you need to bring your ego to have the self-confidence to do it. And eventually in business, there's a point where you have to park your ego or you're going to blow up your business. Exactly. And, and that happened <laughs> a couple of years later. <laughs> All right. But we'll, we'll, we'll get to that a little bit further down the line, but, but help me understand more of just what you were doing to build out of the gate. I mean, there are so many people that start in their twenties, men or women that struggle tremendously and aren't able to get enough clients to survive and keep going. So what were like, what were you doing early on that y- you are still here with us? <laughs> yeah. So n- number one, I, I, I learned through my experience. So I always wanted to, you know, increase my knowledge, read books, learn. So basically, so I could go out there and help and differentiate, differentiate myself as the expert. But I did go in, uh, one of my strategies early on was business owners and it still is today, but helping them in a different way than I was able to help them back then. Back then it was going in and t- talking to them about SEPs and simples. And in rural Oregon, we have a lot of business owners. And so I, I, that's kind of the avenue where I started. I also <laughs> solicited friends and family, and we are in a small community. And so I w- the work that I was doing, people were happy and the referral network grew. And so it just, it, it was, it was a lot. I don't, I, you know, I, I probably block out a lot of the, <laughs> A lot of those early days, but it was a lot of work. <laughs> so, hey, like the friends and family side, I I get how how are you trying to get to business owners, like even just to talk to them about SEPs and simples? Where you are, uh, I like, would walk into their businesses. So just pounding door to, the pavement, <laughs> door to door, pounding the pavements. Like go down to Main Street and and how do you get in? Like how do you how do you reach them? Well, a smile goes a long way. <laughs> you just go up to the counter, kind of talk to the manager, and manager comes out, like, kind of talk to you about pretty steps much. And well, 
I do remember having this line talking about, you know, you didn't go into business to go broke. You went into business to build a future for yourself. And I think it makes sense that we sit down and we talk about how you can build wealth outside of your company. Mm, okay. And so that was that was kind of the angle, the peak, the peak your interests, like you're you're building all this wealth in your company. At some point you've got to reap what you sow. So like, how are you, know, how are you going to start building wealth outside your company? Exactly. And today it's turned into exit planning, uh, which is able to take it uh, deeper. But at the point then it was like, no, let's just get you to start saving for your retirement and, you know, looking at this as a tax deduction for your business and in trying to get them to see the value of starting to pay themselves first. And it's worth knowing, I mean, this is in a context where you know, 20 odd years ago, like SEPs and Simples were very popular. 401k plans were still relatively expensive for a lot of small businesses to offer. There wasn't a solo 401k plan yet. Like, and a lot of people just reverted back to IRAs. And so like talking SEP and simple IRAs, like that, that was a new thing at the time. Like that was a, that was a leading retirement planning for business owners conversation at the time. Yes, yes. And then there was a lot of Roth IRAs and the company I was with was an insurance company. So I did life insurance. So it was a lot of small accounts. It was, I mean, that's, and that's still who we serve today is the mass affluent. Although I would imagine then it wasn't even just kind of mass affluent households that maybe have a hundred or a few hundred thousand dollars. I'm, I'm going to imagine this was all the way down to like, oh, you need a, what would have been that $2,000 IRA? Like I'll, I will help you open that $2,000 IRA. Yeah. And I was eager to help people. Like that's still the heart of, of what I love about our business is I want to create value and I want to help people. And uh, and I, I've never wanted to turn anyone away. And in fact, over the years, we have maintained a zero account minimum. And we can talk about that more when we get to today. But that it, it was, I remember a, a client that I helped them start saving $50 a month into a mutual fund. And then five years later, they, it was, one of my biggest accounts, they had received an inheritance. It was probably not quite a million, but I think six or 700,000. And it was like, wow, see the, you know, it's like you're planting all of these seeds and the, you know, you start seeing those fruits. And so getting clients early on was like just a, just a volume activity any, anybody I can get, anything that comes in the door, if there's some revenue, we're going to make this work. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I did seminars. I uh, was part of the chamber. I was out in the community. I, it was just a lot of sheer determination. <laughs> but I, I'm struck that just you, you found ways to turn it just into business at the end of the day. I mean, I, I know a lot of advisors who come in and just full of full of heart and eager to help people, but, you know, being eager to help people doesn't mean people volunteer to be helped by, by you. Unfortunately, it's still a crowded space. So what, what was driving it? Yeah. Like what was driving it for you? So I have listened to Tony Robbins since I was probably 19 years old. (laughs) So that sales mindset, how to influence people, how to, not sales, but it is sales, right? So how do you build rapport? How do you get them? How do you build that trust? How do you define the needs and then create solutions? And so I was a student of personal development and and using those skills to influence people. And really, I, I like to say inspire, like my what I truly believe in inside is I want to inspire people to abundance and to building this life that they want to build. And now for business owners, like how, how can I help them on a journey to, to get freedom back from, from all of the, you know, building this business that takes so much work. 
any particular Tony Robbins, I don't know, books, readings, something you would recommend for someone who's listening and wants to to try this today? Because I, I would imagine a lot of what Tony does and has written is pretty timeless. Oh, yeah. So the Unleash the Power Within, whether you go to his conference or you read, go to YouTube and punch it in. I mean, there's so much work out there, but Unleash the Power Within is that really understanding human needs and what drives human behavior and and taking that and creating an action plan for what you want and going after it. I wrote I wrote a piece about it for Investment News. We, maybe we could ta- you know I can give you that link and you could Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We'll include it in. So the uh, this is episode 164. So if you go to kitsis.com slash 164, we'll have a link out to uh, uh, to Julia's investment news article around this. So, you know, you've been like absorbing Tony Robbins, getting some ideas of how to connect people with people, build rapport, turn that into business and people that say yes, start getting some traction. At least there's enough dollars in revenue coming in that you're you're still with us here in the business. So the the, the math worked enough. So what what came next? So I think what came next in 2008, I became an endorsed local provider at the time. It was called that for Dave Ramsey. Okay. Which so is, join, that, yeah, that's now their uh, Smart, Smart Vester Pro Vester. program? Exactly. Okay. And that I, what happened there was I was working with, <laughs> I was working with an insurance company that that really brainwashed us <laughs> to look at uh, insurance as, you know, it was pr- we're all around permanent insurance. Insurance is an investment, you know, just like this one sale, everyone needs this. To where Dave Ramsey kind of opened my eyes to more financial planning and looking at a different way to help people. And it was, I read Total Money Makeover. It just made so much sense to me. And I, at that point, I went to the website, I put our information in, and then it was probably not until, that was probably in 2007 and 2008, a year later is when we got the territory. And that, yeah, and that was, you know, I remember it was $600 a month (laughs) that I had to pay for, to be part of the program. And I remember just thinking, oh oh my goodness, this is a huge commitment. Yeah, that's a, that's a, (laughs) that's a big number, particularly if you're still er early on in the business. Yeah. And so at that point I, I, but I decided to go for it. And then what I realized was the, it was, I was not congruent with the company that I was still affiliated with at the time. 2008 happened. I had a baby. So there was like this, all of this, all of these events were just pointing me in the direction of I needed to make a different shift in my career and I needed to become totally independent at that point. You know, it's it's an interesting transition for for advisors when you like you kind of have this realization of I'm not sure I'm actually feeling so good about the company that I'm with, <laughs> the the platform that I'm 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 with. And and I guess realizing or deciding that you may have to make that change, which is messy, even in the best of circumstances and a real pain sometimes. So was there a, was there a particular like trigger moment or event or something? Well, the whole meltdown. I mean, I, I remember the fall of 2008, I was five months pregnant. The market was going down every day. I mean, I, I, I couldn't talk people into hanging on anymore, right? Like I, my, my energy was just totally zapped and I didn't feel like I was being supported by the, my, my branch office that, oh, by the way, was taking probably 40% of the split. (laughs) So I, I, I said, I'm, I'm three hours away. I'm on my own out here. I, you know, I was running my business like a business or like a, you know, solopreneur at that point. But I'm at that point, I'm like, I, I just needed to get a place where I was independent and making, it was a money decision at that point too, I think, because I was feeling like I wasn't getting what I was, the value for what I was giving up. Right. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, the, 
platforms do take a, sometimes a non-trivial portion of revenue. But the reality is if you're running a business, like you have to spend a portion of your revenue on overhead and office and rent and support staff and compliance and technology and all this stuff. So like it's, it's, it's not necessarily a bad thing that platforms take a portion of the revenue because you're going to have to spend it anyways. But if what they're giving you is not worth what you could just spend the money on yourself and do it cheaper, at some point, the math doesn't work just because you say, like, I can replace what my platform does for a lower cost than what my platform does or find another platform that provides similar but takes less off my grid. Yeah. And at that point, I was paying for my rent. I was paying for, I think I may have had like one part-time assistant. I mean, I was paying for all of that on top of giving them, you know, I think it was 30, 40%. So it just was, and then the revenue, it was getting, you know, at that point I was commission-based. And so it was getting harder to, with the economy, what was doing was to, to make those sales and all of that. And so- Right. When the, uh, you know, when the economy's down and things are going haywire, I mean, it's, it's an interesting thing, you know, the, I find for a lot of people in the business today, you know, we tend to say like, oh, you know, people get really complacent in, uh, in a bull market when the market's going up 10 years, like we need a good bear market and then people will want to move and make transitions. But you know, the, the, the truth, I mean, having been through two of these cycles myself now, people don't break loose when the bear market comes they hunker they freak out and they hunker down and they and they stop opening envelopes now like a year or two after markets go crazy once the dust sells and they start opening envelopes again then realize they're not happy with what's happened like there is absolutely a business opportunity that comes and and like people start going in motion but in the middle of market declines like everybody just hunkers down which means if you're on an AUM model like you know, you, you got to, you got to keep them on board that they don't panic and bail out. And if you're on a commission-based model, like the sales just stop. Yeah. <laughs> this is yep. stops. And at that point, I remember, I, I think I got my advisory license. I was starting to, to dabble in that. And, and so, but when we made the shift to independent, then I really started making that the focus. So, so where did you decide to go when you made a, when you made a transition? Yeah. So in uh, summer, I think my, my son was born in May of 2009 and I think I shifted in late July, early August to LPL. Okay. And, and so why, why LPL? (laughs) I, you know, you're going to laugh, but I remember looking through those industry magazines at the time and I saw like an ad for LPL and it was, I remember seeing like a limousine or something and I'm like, I am on the bus and I need to get to the limousine. <laughs> so marketing imagery works just to be clear, like well, I branding, am very <laughs> branding and marketing works. Like if you find your right target audience and you get the right images in front of them, it connects with people. And you know, at that point I, I didn't ask questions. I didn't, I didn't know that there was signing bonuses and maybe there wasn't back then, but I, I mean, I think about today, I mean, I didn't ask any, I didn't know any of those questions to ask. And so I just, I think I probably had maybe 25 million that I brought over. So maybe they wouldn't have given me anything anyways, but that's where I started in 2009. Wow. Wow. So, a lot of direct mutual fund business. <laughs> yeah. So, so I was going to say, so I presume then like you had some business that came with you, but a bunch that was on old insurance policies that wasn't movable or appropriate to move. Right. Right. So what did it look like when you made the, made the transition, made the leap? Like what, what was the state of the business at that point? So I feel like I still had a staff. I still had one person that was helping me. I... I think at the end of the first year with LPL, it, I maybe did 120, 130,000 of GDC. We called it at that point. <laughs> and 30 million in assets, maybe at the end of that first year. And we just started to think about maybe a couple million in advisory. But at that point, I, I knew that that was the direction I wanted to go because I saw what happened in 2008 when people needed 
needed money out of annuities that said that they would never need the money out of the annuities, right? Or so I saw the damage that was done in 2008 because people didn't anticipate the worst case scenario. And so when you plan, plan for the... (laughs) plan for the best, expect the worst. And so for me, that, that was just that shift of, I, I, need to, I need to help people in a more thoughtful financial planning. Just, so yeah. so I, I know, I mean, a lot of people focus on annuities with the guarantees specifically like for scenarios like 2008, you know, your, your portfolio may be scary, but this annuity contract has some guarantees associated with it. So was that, but at that were those point, not the kinds you were those. doing or, or that didn't hold up for you in practice? I feel like a lot of those income riders did not happen until after the 2008. I mean, the ones that we, it, we no, I don't, they, I mean, it could have had a death benefit guarantee, but not, not the, not when they needed the money. Okay. So, so you had clients that were in just straight up variable annuities, right? Riding the volatility down and, and freaking out more or less the same as anyone else, except now, now you're also in a less liquid contract with some surrender charges and some other things that are not, not as positive at that point. Right. So, so the driver for you, like, so you wanted to go advisory accounts, not like, not necessarily around the business model piece of it, but but more the like I just want to be able to manage client assets more hands on and directly than what I can do with what's off of an annuity product lineup. Well, I think probably both. So getting getting it was always in the commission world. It's all you're always on to the next right, and that's in the bank. I saw that in the bank, and what I didn't want was you know, a thousand clients and not servicing them and giving them them that relationship base. So for me, it was that desire to, I want to take care of you. This is not a transaction. This is a relationship that we're going to build for a lifetime. And so that fit my philosophy with that as well. And, you know, it wasn't, we were probably 50-50 for quite a, you know, probably the next five years. And then, because it's hard because I wanted to grow the business. I wanted to hire. I wanted to do all these things. And you can't do that on a, on a pure advisory business in the beginning. Yeah, it, it's challenging, right? You know, I mean, in, in, the, in the world, I guess, even then when probably a lot of in- variable annuities were still largely paying 5 to 7%, uh, you know, even a lot of A-share mutual funds were, were 4 to 5%. You know, when you when you get when your choice is like a, a client comes in with a hundred thousand dollars, like option A is a commissionable product and you will have five thousand dollars in your bank account in a few weeks, or option B is we put them in an advisory account and three months from now you'll get two hundred and fifty bucks, which is your first quarterly billing on a hundred thousand dollar account. And and just the math of that writ large across a firm while you're still in the early years and building, you know, it, it can be incredibly profitable and viable in the long run as as assets under management add up. But you know, relative to what commissions pay in the past, like it puts a squeeze on people when they're trying to build an advisory business in advisory accounts when the the the, the revenue is that levelized. So so you had this like five year plan of like we're just we're gonna slowly and steadily transition from more commission based accounts into advisory accounts. Yeah, I knew that that was the way that I wanted to go and I and I wanted to build that. Thankfully I was I I I learned personal finance early on and so I was diligent in my own personal financial life of doing all the things that I was preaching. And so that what that, what that allowed me to do was take a modest salary and reinvest all of the profit back in the business. And I wasn't scared of investing. I mean, I was scared maybe, but I did it. Like I, I put the money back into investing in my personal development and hiring people to me always felt like an investment as opposed to a cost. You know, of course it's scary when you're when you're hiring and, and starting to, you know, take on other people that you're responsible for. 
Yeah, there's a saying out there. I guess I heard it first from Mark Tiberian. I don't, I don't know if he originated it or got it got it from somewhere else, but he says something to the effect of, you know, there, there's there's two types of business owners: the ones who view employees as a cost, and the ones who view employees as an investment. Mm-hmm. And you just kind of reflect on that, and like, yeah. <laughs> That's a big difference in you know what you do with your team and how you try to develop them and and grow the business over time. Yeah, and and sitting here today, it's because of the team is is why I'm here. So, so how did this transition go in practice? Was this a like we're going to hold on to some commission business, but new clients are going to go into advisory. We're going to try to rotate clients into advisory over time as like old things come up that they don't need anymore. And we'll just shift them gradually. Like, how did you make this transition? Cause it's, it's, it's hard. And I would like to say that it was an intentional plan, but it, it was, it was, it wasn't that way. It was more about like really going back to the client, and what is a what is a good fit here? Like if if they are in retirement and we need to create that guaranteed income, then okay, maybe something would fit here. And then still doing advisory for a piece of their business as well. So it wasn't a calculated mix we were doing. It was more of, you know, felt feeling of what was right. And that's just kind of how it evolved. But although even now today, I would probably say more goes, you know, it's probably over 90% advisory. And so that's even evolved in my thinking and planning and all of that too. And so as you were starting to do the, as you said, like the building and the, and the hiring. So when you, when you made the transition thing, you said there was kind of one person that came with you, 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 you did your 120,000 of GDC and that, that half year as you were getting going had 30 million over like what came next on that growth trajectory for you yeah so i hired i hired two um full-time staff i think that was in 2010 2011 and then in 2012 i brought on someone that would actually sit in on my appointments and really be able uh, that was one of the most important hires looking back. So to have someone kind of at my side all the time, even in client appointments, because it was helping to then start thinking about that duplication. Like, oh, okay, now I don't have to explain what needs to be done. And now I don't have to do the notes for CRM. Now I don't have to do these things. And that was just saving me so much time, which really increased our my productivity and really started leveling me up. So in, in 2012, I think I had three staff at that time, three years built into building the business. I think I have the numbers here. My, my revenue in 2012 was 420,000. So still growing quite rapidly. And at that point, I'm like, you know, this is working. I'm successful. Uh, You know, it was like, it was, I was working a lot, but I didn't see that at the time. At the time I thought I've arrived, this is working. (laughs) And I actually hosted one of my first client appreciation events. Uh, I rented out a, a boat on a river and we were, I was going to take the 40 of my top clients out for like this cruise. And I just remember like, you remember it was yesterday, like just looking out and just being so grateful for the community that I was creating and helping. And I was creating these relationships. And the, when the night came to a close, um, my assistant um, and I were on the boat. And at that point, you didn't carry your cell phone with you everywhere. (laughs) And so I grabbed my cell phone and looked down and realized I had missed 18 text messages, 11 calls. And oh, that's not good. <laughs> that's not good. It's never good when you can see that. No. Yeah. No, that's so, way too many. 
So I realized that my daughter was traveling in a car and hit head on by a drunk driver. And at that moment, being life flighted to a Portland hospital. So that was like, this was the big moment in my career where here I'm, I'm, my assistant drove me right to the hospital. I got there right when the helicopter was landing. We were in ICU for a week. She had broken ribs, uh, punctured lungs, lacerations to her liver and spleen, just all these internal injuries that she was being monitored. And happy to report she's healthy today. But what I realized was sleeping in ICU next to her, the next the day after her accident, I was calling my office, asking them to bring me my computer, returning phone calls, doing trades, juggling all of the things that I thought I had to do because I had made myself so important in my business. At that point, you know, I was there physically for my daughter, but I wasn't there in all the ways that I needed to be there. And that summer, I needed to stay home and, and help her recover. And, and that's all I wanted to do is be there. But I had to, at that point, juggle all of this stuff with my business. And that was the point, looking back, that I had to make a decision to say, I need to make myself less relevant. I need to transition this so I can build a true business and get out of my own way. And that all came, I mean, just literally off your first client appreciation event. So there was guilt. Where was I? You know, there was a lot of emotions that went into that. Like, what am I doing? And a lot of ego stuff came up then. And it was, it, it was, it was a hard, low time when I thought I had reached this successful moment, then it all came crashing down because I realized how important I was to every aspect of my business. Which ironically up until that point was like, that was a feature. <laughs> that was a pod, like my business is doing well. I'm an essential piece of my piece of my business. I, you know, makes you feel good and valued in your business when you have such a positive impact on your business. All the things that were good were suddenly bad. Mm-hmm. Yep. And a, a lot of self-examination and, and all that stuff. What happened next? What happened as you came away from that? Yeah. So I, I, I kind of, you know, at the time you just kind of go through it, right? And you'd only do what you can do in the moment. And my team, what I realized was my team really stepped up and they were like, Julia, go be with your daughter. We got this. But I didn't have anyone licensed on my team at that point. And so you know, I did have to show up. I did have to do these things. And so I was constantly reaching out to, he is married to my sister-in-law. So kind of a brother-in-law, but not through marriage. Okay. Brother, 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 brother-in-law-in-law. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so, and, and he had this amazing, like 30 years of experience in, in major tech companies at that point, I think he was, he was working for Dell in Chicago. And I remember in, in 2008, early on, I was like, come, come work with me. You know, we can do this. And he just had great different perspective from business. And so I would, I would talk to him and he would help me and he's kind of a mentor to me. Well, at that point he could see that I was, business was going amazing, but I needed help. And at that point, their daughters had all graduated. And so I talked him into moving out, uh, back out to Oregon. And he started working with me, got licensed. And that was in the end of 12, beginning of 2013. And that brought a, that brought this, from up to that point, everyone looked like me on my team, all women. It was you know, I think what that's, I was attracting people like me. I was, you know, you just, it's, it's, you didn't, I didn't have perspective. Our businesses often become reflections of ourselves. So in the early days, like we, we tend to work with clients like us and we tend to attract team members like us, whatever, whatever us is. And, and I think for a lot, for a lot of us early on, particularly hiring and it's, it's, it's sort of a deliberate strategy. Like the, the, you know, like I, I need help with 
you know, I need help with client servicing. So like, I want to hire someone that's like, like me, but likes doing the client servicing stuff. So we hire you like, you get mini me for client servicing and then you make it mini me to help with, in, with that has an investment tool to help with investments and like mini me to be my associate advisor. So, you know, clients will still feel like it's similar to me because I'm literally going to hire us, hire someone who would treat them just the way that I treat them. Like, I, I think we, we do it deliberately early on that it just feels like the natural extension of building the business, at least one small step beyond you or leveraging yourself is to just surround yourself with other people who would be like you and do it the way you would do it, but just not you because you ran out of time. So you, you had many use. So this person was not a mini me. <laughs> this person was, you know, had a lot of experience in corporate America and management experience. I here was grassroots building my business, entrepreneur, visionary, where he brought a wholly a whole different perspective to it. And and that was that was really tough. That's where my ego came in, my it's just like you know, I had to learn to listen generously. I had to learn how to not be reactive. <laughs> and, and, and he, he helped me with a lot of that. And he, he was my greatest teacher, but also, you know, my, my struggle because he was able to speak straight to me and be direct where and I always knew it was coming from a place of love. And so that's what I, that's still today, that's what we have to come back to. But that also sharpened me and it allowed me to, to really expand and grow and, and become more of who I wanted to be, which was not a manager and not hiring people and all of these things that were struggles for me. You know, we, we actually, um, on the other side of it now is so much clarity and, and going through that was, was really hard, but on the other side has been really great. So we, have you, are you familiar with rocket fuel, the whole visionary integrator? Yes, very, very much. So I'm a huge fan of, of, rocket fuel and that that whole framework. Yes. So we are two. And so I am the visionary and he is the integrator. <laughs> and that is why I can say that I am in control, but not in charge. Or I am, I said that backwards. <laughs> All right, wait, wait, wait. So uh, say it again. How does it go? <laughs> I am in charge, but not in control. <laughs> I'm in charge, but not in control. Yeah, I feel like that's a good reflection of what it feels like when you really start growing a business beyond you. Like, I'm in charge. Like, it says so on my business card, but I don't really feel like I'm in control because there's a whole lot of other stuff happening all over the place around me, and it's more than I can possibly keep up with and literally uh, manage and control. So, like, I think I'm in charge, but I don't really feel like I'm in control anymore. <laughs> and the way the way that we explain it to the team is so we have a lot of fishermen clients here on the Oregon coast and even up into Alaska. Have you familiar with like deadliest catch? Uh, yes. Yeah. So there's some boats up there where they have you know the captain is at the back of the boat and they can oversee everyone on deck, right? Making sure everyone's safe. We're on the boat. We're orderly. You know, we're things are happening. And then some of them. The, the captain drives from the front of the boat. And that's like, I'm looking at where we're going. I, you know, I'm looking at the horizon. I see all of these things. And, but they can't see who's on the boat, right? Or they can't make sure that everyone's safe and, and making things happen in the way that it needs to be happen to catch all the fish. <laughs> so what we like to say is I am on the front of the boat, visionary, seeing where we're going. And Chandran is on the back of the boat like making sure that everyone stays on board and we're, we have our systems and we have our processes and everything's going well. So help me understand just a little bit more of this transition it, it, itself when, when Chandran came on board. So like, was this, you know, I, I just, I, I need someone to run this thing so I can be visionary. Was this like, I, I, I just need to do less because I'm like 
drowning in my business or just I just need to do less because I've realized I'm not happy with the balance given what happened in my availability or limited availability for my daughter? Like what what were you solving? Like I get the whole visionary and a greater dynamic now for those who are listening and haven't read it, like highly recommend Rocket Fuel as, as a book of sort of thinking about different types of people. Some are visionaries and just love to be looking forward and others are integrators and they love to just weave all that together in practice. And the combination of the two is particularly explosive, which is the rocket fuel metaphor, but like rocket fuel just came out a few years ago. So you weren't, you weren't reading that in 2012, 2013, when you were making this transition. So what, like, what was going through your head at the time? Like, what were you, what were you trying to do or create or change then? I needed help. So at that point, I, the demand, I needed another advisor. I needed, I needed help because we, at that point I had two different locations, two hours apart. So I would be driving one or two days a week to this other location to service the clients that were building out of there because we were getting so many referrals from the Dave Ramsey program. And so at that point, he moved to where that other office was located. And so he started developing and taking all of those clients and developing the referrals and and just kind of taking on that area, which allowed me to be in my office almost all of the time and, and build the business here. So at that point, we were just, we just had, we just needed more advisors to see people. So it started as just, I, I need client capacity. I mean, it sounds like he, d- he didn't necessarily even come in with the run the business hat. He just came in with the, like, just handle some of these clients. I need to, I, I, I can't keep going back and forth on these locations. No, well, he, no, the intention when he came was that he was going to help build this. It was like that area of the business and help me build it, you know, just keep growing the business because all along I've had this dream to have this, you know, big firm. But at that point, I didn't know, you know, how it would all work out. He knew all of those dreams. And so I think he came from the perspective of, I can help build this with you. But at the time, what needed to happen was just we need to see more people to increase the revenue, to hire more people to. And so he was. You know, I, I, at that point I said, I don't want partners. I, I, I want to build this as an employee. Like everyone's an employee. The clients are financial freedom. That's the model that I'm doing. We will compensate you in a way for this growth. But at that point it wasn't all, it's changed since then, but, and we're just now actually changing it. But at that point it was really clear that he would be financially compensated for it. But, but I was scared. I didn't want to bring on partners or other owners or anything like that. And so it was just by design, like he's, he's, he's going to come on and just help run some of the, the, the firm, the operations help structure some of the client activity stuff at this other office. You don't have to go back and forth as much. Yeah. And he had been in a, he was like my, one of my go-to people to help me with my frustrations and employee issues and all of that. So he knew intimately the business. And so he, he was that partner to, he would be my person to go to, to talk about all of those struggles and things. And so saying like, oh, do you want to just actually deal with them yourself? Was like an easy transition? (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Yes. So how did that go in in practice? Just you've been running and doing everything and now you brought in this highly experienced, highly capable person that's not you <laughs> when you're always used to making all of those decisions and being in control of all of them because the, the business was built around you until you expanded the team and it wasn't. So like, what did that transition look like in practice? I mean, how do you, how do you bring someone else in at that level into the business? Yeah. So it was, we, it was an employee relationship. So we, a salary, we had set up a bonus plan at that point that we still have everyone today are uh, salaried employees. 
And then everyone has a bonus structure. And so that is how it was then with the, uh, with the caveat for him that we would kind of keep track of the growth in this area and we would try to put together, the idea was at the time we would try to put together a, you know, a profit sharing or a, my vision was like a cash balance or a defined benefit or something that would help put more money in his retirement to compensate him for building this value. He, by the way, is over 70. So it was almost like I had this reverse type plan. So when I would go to people to try to get help for succession planning, it was, it was very, uh, they, they couldn't help me because it was opposite. Yeah. Like, so I have a sister who's running the business, but he's in his 70s. So how are we going to manage this? Uh, right. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> so we kind of came up with just a plan between us that I, I think in, neither of us saw how much it would have grown to now. And so we've been working with FP Transitions for the last three months. And we are going to introduce a G2 and, and change the way that we're structured in 2020. So what did it look like in transitioning from just a, a, a management perspective in suddenly having someone else who's at the table, who's making decisions? Like, what does that look like? Well, I had to fire myself. <laughs> and that was hard. <laughs> but it was, I, I, I think what helped me most was I, at that point, I had joined Strategic Coach, which is what led me to Gina Wickman's work and Rock of And so that really helped me start getting away from this, this, it's not all about me. Like I need to figure out how do I create this business that is in their words, self-managing. And, uh, and so that was, so it, that helped with my mindset around it. It was, it was also very apparent that the business was growing at such a rapid pace that, that we had to, we, we need, I needed that help. I needed that expertise and, you know, partner to really check me. And, and it's, it's hard to get feedback that doesn't, doesn't feel good all the time. But it was also, again, I, I said it before, coming from a place of, yeah, I care about you. I love you. I want this to grow. And, you know, you, you need to think about how that is looking to the company or looking to the public. This is a really good example for social media. I remember thinking, ouch, he is so right. <laughs> but at the time, so we had, we had started to do uh, Facebook and really gain some traction on social media, but specifically Facebook. And I hired someone that to do the social media. And so, but all of a sudden what happened was we were getting all of this promotion out there, but it was all about Julia Carlson. It wasn't about financial freedom, wealth management group. And I'm thinking, oh, it's so great. Look at this. Look at all these likes we're getting and look at all this engagement. And he had to sit me down and say, okay, but again, this is not about Julia Carlson. This is about building Financial Freedom Wealth Management Group into a trusted brand and building that trust with other advisors. And, and do you see what's happening here? And I'm like, oh yeah, I could see it. But it, it, so at the time it didn't feel good because I was in charge of making those decisions, but. While he called you out for them. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So when you're in the jar, it's hard to see the label. <laughs> Someone told me that once and I was like, oh my gosh, that's so funny. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. Uh, I like that. I like that when you're in the jar, it's hard to see the label. So, so how did this, I don't know, I guess like it, it evolve or play out over the next, over the next year or two? Like you've, you've, you know, you're, you're kind of buried in the business. Everything's dependent on you. Your daughter has a terrible car accident. You say, oh my gosh, this has to change. 
six months later, you brought in someone else to help manage and, and run the business so that you can stop being as immersed in so many hours back and forth and not going to the other office two hours uh, up the coast and the rest. Right? Like, I, I'm, I'm sure there was a bunch of vision in your head of like, oh, this will be great. Like, he'll deal with a whole bunch of stuff and then I'll have more time. <laughs> not so much. <laughs> yeah. So, so how did this act like, how did this play out over the, the, the next year or two of, of trying to make this work? Yeah. Well, I think we were both, I th- I think we, 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 fa- we saw the momentum of what was happening. I mean, there was from 2014 to 2015, we, doubled. I think we brought in, yeah, almost 60 million in one, in that one year. And it just like, where did that come from? Well, it came from the Dave Ramsey. I mean, a lot of it came from the Dave Ramsey. I started writing a column for the local paper in my community, the social media, we get organically probably five, five, leads that come through our website a week. That's something we track. Are you doing stuff on your (laughs) website to drive that (laughs) or, or just like not a lot of other advisors in the area? So if they're, if they're Googling around in the area, you you come up. Yeah. But also uh, we have a strong presence on Facebook still. And I, it's interesting. I have a, (laughs) I have this, this may take us down a rabbit hole, but I actually competed in bodybuilding for a couple of years. And that was one of the years that I was very disciplined. And in that discipline, they, I thought it would have a horrible impact on my business, but I think it, the opposite happened because I was so disciplined and focused that that showed up in all different aspects of my life. But I think really in business as well or in <laughs> doing bodybuilding like yes uh, weightlifting competition like that that kind of yeah. bodybuilding stuff yeah so it's 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 the category is figure so you can i actually competed at the arnold amateur contest in ohio very cool very cool and so, and so so like so the 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 discipline you're talking about was like i'm I'm going out for the Arnold competition. So just like diet, nutrition, exercise, work, trainer, just like all the stuff that go into competing in the competition meant everything got super structured for you. Exactly. I was, I was up at five. I was doing my workouts. I was meeting with my trainer at lunchtime. I was eating clean and, and no processed food. I was, you know, I was just so disciplined in all those aspects and what I thought would take away from my business actually really helped me super focus and like, okay, when I'm here, I'm going to be here. And when I'm with my kids, I'll be with my kids. And when I'm at the gym, I'm going to be at the gym. And so when you're, when you're leading, when you have the, that hyper-focused activity, yeah, it can be a little obsessive, but it also, I think, brings this, this intensity that, that really sh- showed up. Well, there is the famous saying, like, if you want something done, give it to a busy person. Folks who get really busy but focused about it have to get really good at getting things done with the exact time window that they've got in order to do it and focusing you. Mm-hmm. Exactly. So, so how did the competition go? It went good. Yeah, I think I got maybe sixth place. Was way Her, back in, yeah, it was neat. Very cool. And like what? what possessed you to go down this road? <laughs> like that's don't, don't see that a lot in financial advisor world in general. No, and I ended up competing for about five years. You know, I, I remember thinking I've, I was always an athlete in, in high school. I wanted to do something later. And I, I actually had three, three children. My son was my last one. And I thought, you know, I, I need to get my body back. I need to get in shape. And like, I'm going to set a big goal. And that was the goal I said. <laughs> like you finished having three children and your goal to set was competitive bodybuilding. But like <laughs> that is an insight into <laughs> my character. <laughs> so you were all you are all in for good challenges. Okay. Oh yeah. <laughs> so the business now is beginning to grow rapidly. Dave Ramsey program is ramping up. Your focus that potentially was going to take away from the business ends out actually helping to focus you in the in the business. So how's the, 
dynamic with Chandran through through this as you're now a uh, a year or two in suddenly it's growing a lot faster i would imagine that means the roles are just kind of shifting and amplifying even further yeah we we hired another advisor that that started which helped but all of the advisors that we have ha, ha, we've groomed them so they they haven't come here with a book or have had that necessarily advisor experience. So we have a career track that kind of grooms them up through through that. And we really put the structure in place. We, you know, it, it, it's evolved quite a bit, but with, with the last couple of years, we brought in some, um, a, a coach to actually help us with our accountability chart and really just have that, that clarity of setting goals, creating, if you're familiar with all this, with a scorecard, right? We have 90 day goals. A so this is card. like full, full on entrepreneurial operating system EOS. Exactly. Okay. And who did you hire as a, as a coach for helping to get all this like focus for the business? Yeah, so that is Lisa Dion of Strategic Advisor Solutions. Okay, Lisa Dion of Strategic Advisor Solutions. So she is specifically a an EOS coach in the whole Gino Wickman traction system. Yeah, well, she's evolved too. At the, at the beginning, yes, but she's she's really shifted a, away from uh, because they're a technical EOS implementer, and she only works with RIAs, financial advisors that want to grow and has really tailored it to our industry. So it's a lot of inspired by that, I'll say, but there's some, some, some other stuff that is different. And so, you know, she's made it her own and, you know, that to have someone that to have someone come into our offices and help facilitate those conversations, that was kind of a game changer for developing my executive team that we have now and just was instrumental in getting us to where we are at today. So, so what does that look like now? Like where, where is the business today? Yeah. So we have a a team of 13. We have five advisors, including myself, although I am kind of shifting away from the one-on-one client relationships and I, my goal is to work more with uh, business owner clients. We have Jason Harris is our vice president and Chandran is the president and I am the CEO. And so, they, so the three of us is the executive team. So we are the ones that kind of make the strategic decisions. You know, we have very structured meetings every Monday. We, we are very in alignment for the culture of the firm, where we're going, very focused on all of that. Okay. And and what's the size of the firm overall of of client base or asset base or however you measure it now? Well, I thought we were going to hit 300 million last week, but the market didn't help yesterday. <laughs> so we're about... <laughs> market market volatility <laughs> now is standing. So three, 300 so, million-ish. Yeah. So we're about 295. <laughs> and how many client households probably about a thousand ish okay so so you're you really are right in that kind of classic mass affluent couple hundred thousand dollar client average yes although we have we have quite quite a lot on a digital platform so we are we're seeing a kind of a divide is the way that i'm envisioning this where we have a very automated program that helps clients onboard themselves onto the digital platform. And those are for the clients that just need to save money, right? They, they just need to accumulate and have a good asset allocation. And so... And is, is that uh, LPL's guided wealth portfolios? Exactly. Structure? Okay. Yes. So we're developing more of automated educational material, emails, you know, that will webinars, education that'll just get people to that platform. And then 
thinking of the people that we want to come visit us or the people that really need our full services and they need to start thinking about their their legacy. They're impacted by the SECURE Act, right? And you, we want to help them navigate that and really help them with the distribution planning aspects of planning. So we're seeing, so we have this kind of divide. We have a lot of clients that are eager just to get going and that's a lot of the Dave Ramsey. So we're trying to, to automate that experience. Okay. And so that's part of, you were saying earlier, you, you've kept a zero dollar minimum. So part of the way you're doing that is guide to wealth portfolios is essentially your quote robo solution. And so folks that just need that straightforward solution you can route them there. They can do most of it themselves. Your Dave Ramsey referrals that aren't a good fit for the core business can can still get some help and a solution there, but it's very limited time for the firm because it's heavily a- a- automated for those folks. Exactly. Exactly. I, you know, I, I've had a lot of coaches and mentors and other advisors tell me that, you know, I have to start selling off my clients or firing clients, but I, it just never felt good to me. And so, when when LPL came out with this platform, I'm like, this is <laughs> this is going to work, <laughs> and we we have always, I mean, we've been on the platform since day one in the pilot program, and I think maybe still even number one in the program. Well, and it it, it strikes me as well. I mean, I, I I think there were a lot of firms that saw these digital platforms getting launched and said like. Oh, I can put a button on my website and people will give me money with no work. Like, sure, I'll do that. That sounds great. And and then of course, like you assets don't just freely fall from the sky, that it doesn't show up that way. But you know, for a firm like yours that has a lot of marketing channels, has a presence in the community that that you know, has a funnel of traffic that comes from from the Dave Ramsey program, like you've already got sources, you've already got a flow of these clients. It just becomes a question of where are we going to route the people we're already getting? And then it becomes, I, I think, a little bit more appealing and easier to, to leverage and get something out of. Because you, like you've, you've got the flow, you're just, you just have to steer them somewhere. It's not as though you just put the button on your website and waited for clients to show up. Yeah, and do it in a way that is creating value for them, right? And in a way that they don't feel like they're just being brushed off, that no, this really is a good solution for you. And 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 we have, you know, computers in our lobbies that if clients want to come in and we can help assist them in getting them set up. And so it's it's evolved over time, but it, there's there's we have a lot of momentum in that and it it feels like I can totally see it scaling in a profitable way. So as you look at all of this change, like what's, what was the biggest shift for you from kind of the, one of the, I guess if it's the measuring point, like the, the pre-car accident days versus the post-car accident days? I think I had to really discover myself and know myself and and be okay with my strengths and actually lean into those strengths because what I've realized is that there are other people that are going to have the strengths to your weaknesses. And so it, it was really that, and I'm, and I'm still evolving, right? I'm only 42 and I've got a lot of career left. And so it's, it's really keeping keeping that discovery process, knowing what, what I want to do and what I'm good at and planting that flag. And then having this amazing team that can help see that vision and, and go there together as a team. So how have you, how do you figure that out? Well, there's a very practical (laughs) exercise that I, that I have done that is really helpful. And it's just about tracking, like thinking about all of the different things that I do in a week, any of us that are listening to this, like sit down and write a list of all the different things that you do in a given week from grocery shopping to working out, to hanging out with the kids, to all the activities as a business owner, 
social media. I do a blog. You know, there's all these things, the client appointments, prospect appointments, networking, email, all of these things. And so after you do that, then you sit down with the list and you figure out what gets me excited on this list. What is, what, what am I so excited to do on this list that it gives me energy. I can keep doing it forever. And it, and it, it sows into my life and then identifying the opposite to that. Like, you know, what is taking time that I'm doing that I don't want to be doing. And so if you can do that on, for me, it's kind of a regular basis that I check in with myself and say, am I doing what I love to be doing? And how do I keep eliminating the things that I don't like to? And when you want to eliminate them, then it's, okay, I got to hire someone else to do this. Yeah. Then it's learning the art of delegation, which that was probably what I had to learn after my daughter's accident. Like I felt like I had to hold on to all those things because of course I could be, I, I was the only one that was going to do it the special way that it needed to happen. But we of course know that that's not true. And so it's like you, you have to learn that delegation is something we learn. It's not something that we have in us. <laughs> and so there's a lot of resources for that. But Were there any in particular for you that you use just to help figure out how to do that well? Yeah. So there is, it was through Strategic Coach. There was level, I think it's called level one, level two, level three, level four. It's a very technical, but it's, we actually printed the levels off and put it on every employee's computer (laughs) workspace. And so when I was giving them a task, if I set a level one, it was, Hey, research this and get back to me with, with what needs to happen. Or if it was a change of address, let's say it would be a level four. Hey, change this address and I don't, I'm going to delete the email because I'm going to assume that you've got it. And so you want everyone to graduate to a level four. And, but oftentimes you have to go through, teach them the levels to build that trust with an employee, especially a new employee. And so, so that, that was the, the model that we use to understand what my expectations were you know, for the staff. Okay. So were there other things that you were uh, like doing or trying or exploring or, or, or testing just to figure out this, like, what do I like doing? What do I not like doing? And how do I actually get rid of the things I don't like and do more of the things that I do like? I mean, it's pretty... I have to say it's pretty simple. Like when you can tune in and know thyself (laughs) and, and then get rid of, you know, fire yourself from the other things. And then you you have the freedom to do what you love to do. It's really that simple. (laughs) So it's mostly just in our heads that we don't think that'll work or limit ourselves or deny ourselves or all the other things that slow us down from that. I think so. It's, it's definitely a, a mindset shift where if you're like when I was out of the office things happened when when I'm not available you know the, it they figure it out and now I travel quite a bit for speaking for uh, vacation for you know doing things with my kids I, you know it's I I was gonna add it up last year how many days I was out of the office it was quite a bit and the team I hardly when I come back to the office now, maybe 20, 30 minutes to get caught up. There's just not, you know, the team is so efficient and trained that, and I'm, I'm at conferences. I don't get interrupted. I don't have to return phone calls at breaks. Well, that sounds glorious. (laughs) (laughs) Wow. So what surprised you the most about building your own advisory business? What surprised me the most probably getting to this place now. It's like to, to be able to say what I just said and be that be true, you know, that feels really good. Like I'm experiencing that freedom that I desired, you know, eight years ago when my daughter was in an accident. Right. And so it's like, I can say it, it, it's all happening and yeah, it's a surprise. It kind of feels like that, but it's also, it's, 
it's exciting to see. And I'm just kind of excited to see where we, we go. So what does a typical week look like for you at this point? So when I'm in the office, Mondays and Fridays are, Mondays are all staff meetings, executive team meetings, a lot of advisors call to pick my brain. <laughs> So if, if client or if advisors reach out to me and, and want help, then I will save that for Mondays. If I do have client facing appointments or seminars, workshops that happens Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and then Fridays are more, I'm usually out of the office early on the summer. I take that with my kids. And so it's more of a flexible day. Okay. And, and that's something you try to hold to strictly now uh, of like clients thou shalt meet with me on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, (laughs) and Thursdays? Yes. Yes. And did you get pushback on that? Of course, in the beginning. And it's, I I had to get myself out of, I, I had to get myself totally out of the equation because I would bend the rules for myself. <laughs> like, so I had to have someone totally run my schedule. So what is that like? So like you just, you don't control your calendar. Someone else does all the bookings on it. Yes, correct. Once you, once they didn't have to ask you, so you could feel like you wanted to make an exception, then the exception stopped. <laughs> right. And in the, and it, they did come back for exceptions. We probably dealt with that for a year of, oh, they're used to meeting you on Monday. They have to meet you on a Monday. And I'm like, well, they can meet this advisor on a Monday, but they can't meet me on a Monday. And then we, I mean, I had to get, I had to back out of client house appointments, night appointments, weekend appointments. Cause in the beginning, anytime you could meet, I'd be available. Yep. 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 <laughs> and so now I, I did, I went the whole doctor thing. Well, would they be able to visit their doctor on a Saturday? Probably not. <laughs> As I was your justification, like, uh, this is not how they're meeting with their other professionals. I'm going to handle myself as a professional. That means like the, they're meeting me in my office on my terms, not the other way around. What was the low point on the journey for you? Well, I, I probably have to say my daughter's accident, but there was probably times before that building, you know, building the business that were high highs and low lows. And I think for anyone starting their own business and especially in this industry, it's, you go in, in such ebbs and flows. There were a lot of times in those early days that, you know, I, I wanted to go back to a salary at the bank or, you know, I, I wanted to give up, but it was just that, you know, pushing through all those no's to get to the yeses. So what was the hardest thing to let go of after your daughter's accident and all the things you were transitioning and letting go of? I think the client appointments that was like get meeting with clients meeting, appointments or just like sched, scheduling the appointments. Oh no, meeting, meeting. I mean there were times where I would run boy, 35 meetings a week back to back to back to back. I mean it was just and then stay up, you know, I'd go home. I mean well that was before kids. I mean I I would like you know all the time I was working building it. And so yeah, and I, I really enjoy that. I, I enjoy helping and doing that. But over time, when I do I want to be a business owner or do I want to be an advisor? And do I want to help? I can make a bigger impact if I help other advisors, you know, and train them and, and groom them and build the, and, and, and grow the company. Like we could have even more impact. And so... But giving up, giving up those one-on-one relationships have, has been difficult. What was the blocking point for it for you? Was it just like literally the relationship or the like, I don't know if this other advisor is going to take care of this client the way I want them to be taken care of? Yeah, I think probably, you know, the clients that weren't near and dear to me, it was probably easier to give them, give them up, but it was also making sure that we were going to have complaints and, and they were going to be taken care of. And are they going to do it the way that I would do it? Or the, so that, those were all the kind of things, are they going to get the sale? Because if I was there, I'd get the sale, it was, you know, that kind of stuff. So how do you work through that? Cause like you want the sale, <laughs> want to get the client. 
Yeah. So we have a, Chandran has developed a training program in in sales and influence. And we're, we're, we have alignment with how we do that. And so he has taken over the accountability and responsibility of training the advisors. So fairly straightforward answer at the end of the day. Like if you're worried that they're not going to get the sale, then teach them how to sell, teach them how to get the client. And here's the bottom line. I'm sure we have lost some, right. That I would have gotten. And we have lost some clients that weren't okay with not having me. But for us to evolve into this true team that we are today, you know, it, it wasn't going to work that, that they could only talk to me. So on one hand, uh, because we do have so many clients, you know, it, losing one client isn't a huge impact, although that is never the goal. But if they're not aligned with who we've become in this evolution of me to a team of 13, then they're not a good fit for us anymore. Well, and there, is, there is just an interesting effect I find that comes that in the, you know, in the early days where, you know, the business is maybe not where we want it just from a revenue and income perspective, you know, it's, it feels very, very hard to ever do anything that could risk a client relationship. Because like, I, I, I need that client. I need every client. I need every dollar coming in because I'm, I'm trying to get to a certain level. But there comes a point in the business where, as you know, like when you, when you have a thousand clients, like losing one is not going to blow up the business. It's not going to undermine the ability to be reasonably on track for goals this year. At some point, like, the the incremental learning value for the advisor that had a shot and missed it and can learn from it is actually probably more valuable for the business in the long run than just getting that one client and and not having the advisor learn the lesson. You just either have to get to the point where you're large enough to be able to manage that or just have the mentality to say, well, you know, bummer we lost a client that maybe we sort of needed, but this is still better for us in the long run. And how do we learn from it moving forward? Yeah. So anything you wish you'd done really differently? Like what do you, aside from just growing the business beyond yourself, sort of in the aggregate discussion, like what do you know now that you wish you could go tell you from 10 years ago as you're making this transition to LPL? Yeah, I feel like, you know, getting out of my own way earlier on. (laughs) and so being open, being open to listening, you know, more, not being so reactive, right? I, there, you, we have an amazing team, but we also lost a lot of employees and we had that turnover because of the way that I was managing them. And so yeah, I, that was when I got out of the hiring process, that was the biggest uh, win for the company and relief for me. <laughs> and like, to what do you I don't uh, attribute that. Is this just like in retrospect, I'm, I'm just not the best at kind of figuring out who's going to be a good fit employee or not, or, or was there something else to the, the challenge of having you in the hiring process and feeling better that you're out of it? What was happening was I would get people excited and I would inspire them. And then I, we would, so we, I, it would all be, it would be all future focus and all, we're going to be excited and you're going to be a great fit. And not really being able to ask the right questions and not see the best in someone or be able to really make sure that this was a good fit for the position being hired. Because I, I want to naturally see the good in people. And I also expect everyone is going to be as driven and determined as me. <laughs> and that's not the case. <laughs> And so just letting go of the hiring process got it to someone else who was just better able to figure out who was going to be the right fit, you know, right person, right seat in, in, uh, in, in EOS terms and just get them grounded to here's what you're really good at. Here's what our position actually needs. Are these lined up appropriately? So is it strange to be the owner of a firm that isn't making the hiring decisions for the no, people whose paychecks you, you write? <laughs> It's fantastic because <laughs> I don't have to do the firing either. <laughs> oh, well, that's a good trade-off then. 
that's a good trade off. But but again, I think that's part of the 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 challenge, right? Like a, as you were saying, there's sort of these things that we should on ourselves. Like I'm I'm the founder of the firm, right? Or I I own the firm. Like I sh- I should have to make these decisions and make these calls. I think one that we often tend to keep is is around talent and hiring and who works in the business or not that it's it's a it's a big transition to say like no i i actually don't need to be the one that runs this process and makes these decisions Mm -hmm. it it, it comes back to the in charge but not in control (laughs) yes yeah so what advice would you give to newer advisors coming into the business today Hmm. i i feel like the they have to decide who they want to become, right? Do they want to become a business owner? Do they want to be part of a thriving team? You know, like deciding that path is important in the beginning because we have to decide and then visualize what we want for them to go make that happen. Well, I, I've got to ask, like you started down that path and you changed your path. So is that like a, uh... I probably would have been on this path all along if I had just someone had asked me and I'd spent more time on it sooner. Or did you, did you have to do one path before you could get to the current one? That would be my guess. I I feel like it's, that was all kind of my journey to get to where I'm at today. I I had to go through those experiences to, to get to today. I, yeah. So it's hard to, it's hard to really, go back and say, I wish things were different because it, I don't really. Yeah. It's all, it all becomes part of the journey. Well, so, so does that impact what you would tell someone coming in who maybe doesn't, doesn't know what their journey is going to be or like, you know, what do you want to become? I don't know. I didn't know what I wanted to be with 20 something years old. I, I guess in retrospect, I, had a few ideas in my head, but those didn't particularly line up to what I actually ended up deciding I like to do after five or 10 years of experience. Yeah. So maybe a better way to answer that is, is being open and, and you have to, you have to self-discover about yourself and being open to the different opportunities that come your way. I, it's, it's hard, I think, for someone brand new to start a business, even as a solo advisor it, today, it's a lot different than where it was 20 years ago. Yeah. It, it, uh, on the one hand, like w- w- way cooler technology and efficiency to do stuff now than, than what you could do 20 years ago. You know, I think the challenge just it's, it's a more crowded landscape. I mean, there were back then there were a lot of people that said they quote did financial advising, but they were really predominantly in this, in the product business for the overwhelming majority of advisors. Now, like, there's a lot of people that really focus on giving clients financial advice, like really being focused on the advice, you know, just like saying, no, no, we actually do it. Doesn't, doesn't work now the way that it did in the past. So was there, aside from just the, the shift that happened from the, your daughter's car accident, like, was there some point where you looked at the business and said, like, we've, we've, we've made it like, it's worked. The transition has worked. I'm, I'm really in a different place now. Probably just the last couple of years when our, when, when profitability came back, <laughs> right? I mean, there were several times when I would do those silly benchmark studies that would be like, oh, okay, you're spending too much money in this area and too much money in marketing and too much money on staffing. And, and, and I'm like trying to shake them saying, yeah, but I'm reinvesting into my business, right? Like it's, are they growing? Are those other advisors that I'm being benchmarked to growing at this rate, right? Because there is a time when we had very small profitability in an industry where you should have pretty good profitability. So, but I had to go, that was, you know, I'm seeing that profitability back now, which is really exciting to see. Yeah, there's, it's an interesting effect to me that we our industry spends a lot of time talking about the profitability and not a lot of time talking about the growth when the reality is, well, A, just the more you spend on marketing, the less you will have on profitability because marketing tends to come from free cash flow to reinvest for growth. So like 
granted a whole other discussion about whether your marketing is getting a good ROI, but just in general, like firms that are trying to grow more and reinvesting more into marketing will have lower profitability. That isn't necessarily a sign of anything negative or unhealthy in the business. Like that's the point of investing for growth. Exactly. And I wasn't going to go take debt to put capital into my business, right? To do that. I'd rather take that from profits. All right. And then you have to hire the staff and the, like, you want to grow faster. You, someone's got to help run the marketing and then someone's got to screen all the calls. And then someone's got to take the actual clients that you're bringing in who may not be a full advisor yet, but you're going to try to ramp them up quickly. Like just, there's a, there's a lot of hiring and spending that happens when you're really trying to power organic growth. Yeah. So maybe when I was talking about deciding what you want, that's, I didn't know all of those different intricacies. Like I didn't realize all those ceiling of complexities that it was going to be hitting along the way. And so now looking back when other advisors reach out to me and ask for help, I'm like, okay, let's first celebrate the frustrations you're experiencing because it means that you're hitting this ceiling where you need to bust through and get to the another level. And, and so for me, like, I didn't know that, that was, it was going to be that hard back in the day. I just thought, oh, I'm going to build a good business. And so it, it's like, do, do, does someone brand new want to go through all those trials and tribulations and get to the other side? And I, I love the way you put it of just kind of these ceilings of complexities that, you know, you you grow and you hit and they become ceilings and you whack into them and they stop your growth and they halt you until you figure out how to, how to work around and work through them. And then when you get through them, you get another growth cycle until you hit another complexity ceiling and that happens because that's what happens when the firm gets bigger and there's more people. It, it also gets more complex. So what's the, is there a complexity ceiling that you're staring down now or worried about now? (laughs) So I, I hear one is coming around $3 million in revenue, so that, that should be pretty soon. <laughs> I'm hoping that we have put the structure and, and everything in place to just bust through that and not even feel it. <laughs> but, I, but I also know to celebrate those frustrations for myself as they come. And, and what, is that, what is that complexity ceiling look like for the firm? Like, where do you, what are, the, are there pain points you're expecting? I think it's... What I feel is I have to get out of that client facing role, and so I'm thinking about how how can i how can I do things in group settings? How can I use technology more how can i how can I do things where it's still satisfying satisfying that need in me to connect and educate and inspire? but I feel like my greater good is going to be on a bigger level than the one on one so as we wrap up, this is a, a podcast about success. And, and one of the themes that always comes up is just the, the word success means different things to different people, sometimes very different things to us as we go through life and changes happen in our world. So you're on the path for this incredibly successful business trajectory and, and closing in on 300 million of AUM and three, 3 million of revenue. How do you define success for yourself at this point? Mm, great question. I. I feel I've had success at different moments. You know, I feel like it's also been redefined in my journey. Now I feel like it's that fulfillment of happiness and feeling joy and not feeling that I have to be onto the next and onto the next, but I can enjoy the moments more in the day to day and giving back to my team, giving back to the industry, you know, speaking more, you know, all of that is feeling really good to me and feeling, making me feel fulfilled. Well, very cool. I appreciate you willing to join us and give back to the industry and sharing just the, the story and the, and the journey from advisor to advisory firm business owner. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you for joining us, Julie, on the Financial Advisor Success Podcast. Want even more ideas, tools, and resources on how to break through to the next level of success as a financial advisor? Check out the leading financial planning industry blog, Nerd's Eye View, at www.kitsis.com, where Michael covers the latest practice management trends and financial planning strategies. 
And by joining the members section, you can earn IMCA and CFP continuing education credits along with exclusive member content. Get it all now at www.kitsis.com.